Dramatic footage has come to light showing Michael Jackson dangling another baby from a hotel window. Here he is in a Munich hotel room in July 1997, five years before he held baby blanket over a balcony in Berlin. He sits with Debbie Rowe, the mother of his children, before she urges him to show the waiting crowds baby Prince Michael. friendship with Michael Jackson. Uh, what did you make? I did. Yeah. But what... he was a young guy and I was a young little boy girl, like 13. And there are pictures of me like sort of pixie girl. Yeah. At We're around 12, at 13, looking like a, a boy and stuff. Well, not then, earlier, mm. because that was a bit later. What do you make, um, Tatum, of this, first... this documentary? I don't know. I watched that documentary. Yeah, what do you that make of it? That was... It's hard not to to. Um, it's hard not it's hard not to believe, uh, right? Those boys. It has been seven years since Michael Jackson died, and tonight there is a new claim of sexual abuse by the pop star. This time, a woman has come forward with letters and big checks she says prove her case. CBS 2's Tom Waite is live in Irvine to explain why she's coming forward after staying silent for decades. And Paul and Pat will get to that evidence in just a second here, but this alleged victim says she came forward to help other victims come out of the shadows. These handwritten notes allegedly signed by Michael Jackson are now being used as evidence to prove he molested a young girl back in the late 80s. The accuser is now a 42-year-old mother. She has not publicly identified herself, but along with the notes, she also saved these checks that her lawyers claim were used to keep their client quiet for decades. My client was sexually abused by Michael Jackson uh, in the mid-80s to the late 80s, uh, beginning when she was 13, all the way through the time she she was 15 years old. Vince Finaldi also represents two other Jackson accusers. Finaldi says in the case of his female client, the abuse began when she went with her family to see Jackson's Havenhurst home. Jackson spotted her as he was driving into the gate and invited the family inside. After that, he began calling her house speaking with her. Finaldi says Jackson would invite his female accuser to visit him at his home and on movie sets where the abuse allegedly took place. He would send her notes like this one. I really like talking to you. You are so sweet. I love you and miss you very much. All my love. Please come to see me. Your mother and father are nice. Jackson allegedly signed the note with his initials. Jackson also allegedly sent these checks. This one for $600,000. Another for a hundred and 30,000, this one for a total of 150K. Finaldi says his client came forward now for multiple reasons. Jackson Camp was saying, well, you know, he didn't only have boys around him, he had girls around him, and there were girls at Neverland, and there were girls in his bedroom, and he's never sexually abused a girl. She said, well, you know, in fact, I'm a girl, and he sexually abused me. When I was then, about the age of 13, I was a little bit cheeky, but well, I think I was a little bit naive as well, looking back. Terry George says he was 13 and a keen collector of celebrity interviews when he met Michael in Leeds in the north of England. For the rest of the Jacksons, it was just another stop on their 1979 European tour. But for Michael, says Terry George, it was a chance to make a new friend. 
Uh, what is your name? Michael Jackson. Michael would tour all over the world. There were little boys everywhere that would come to the hotels. And what is your job? Still. I'm a singer. I didn't really mingle with other people, and I didn't really have a lot of friends then. Determined to interview his idol, Terry says he found out where the Jacksons were staying. Then, armed with Michael's hotel room number and a tape recorder, he simply knocked on his door. Uh, what do you like most? Things that you like? I like kids a lot. <laughs> wow. Certainly a lot smaller than it ever was. It uh, feels like it's been totally restructured. Michael said, who is it? And I said, oh, my name's Terry. I've come to do an interview. And then he opened the door and says, oh, uh, he looked a bit shocked to see me, really. <laughs> He's probably looking at this level. I was down here somewhere. I came into the room and I was sat on this bed here. But the gap seemed much bigger as well because I had my, my tape recorder down there. Terry George says that at the end of the interview, he and Michael Jackson swapped phone numbers. You know, him giving me his number and asking for mine didn't really feel strange at all. It was great. It was a thrill. It was, you know, I was happy to be in touch with the celebrity. After the tour left Britain, Terry George says that Michael Jackson started calling two or three times a week and they had friendly conversations about their lives. His calls came quite late at night, normally for anything from 11 in the evening, 10 in the evening, right through to 5 o'clock in the morning on some occasions. And then one night, he says Michael made a call that Terry has never forgotten. I had phone sex with Jacko, is what the press wrote. I met with Terry George to hear his account of what really happened that night. He spoke about masturbation. About him masturbating, did I masturbate? I never saw it coming. Um, it wasn't something I expected. It just came out of the blue, really. He said, would you believe that I'm doing it now? And let me hear him on the telephone, I could hear it. And what did you think he meant by that? Well, I knew what he meant by that, because he was talking about it. He was talking about masturbation. I did feel uncomfortable. I can remember feeling uncomfortable. I felt awkward. I, I, I saw a picture of you and Jodie Foster, you and Christy McNichol. It's so funny how back in the 70s, we didn't know. Like, did you did you know that Jodie Foster was gay or Christy McNichol was, or was that not even talked about? Michael, no. You, you had no idea? No clue. Michael uh, Jackson? Yeah. Uh, do you think he was? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think so, too, but, you know, you never... Yeah. Now, why do you say, yeah, like, convincingly? Did you know him? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a story in there, too, about uh, him and I doing a television show we did in, in uh, Swiss Germany, in German-Swiss uh, area, Les Ans. And um, he asked me what it was like to master. What did you tell him? I told him, uh, you can find out for yourself. Uh, you know, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to show him. of rock may not be legally married. Our investigation began in the Dominican Republic, where we went to retrace the steps the couple took to the altar. Just days before the wedding, Lisa Marie's assistant arrived, booked hotel rooms, and rented two vans. Then on May 24th, the lovebirds arrived. According to the official version of the story, the couple stayed here at the world-famous resort Casa de Campo. And then several days later, they got into a white van and drove to a distant part of the island. There, at a magistrate's house, they were married at 10 a.m. At least, that's what the official wedding documents indicate. But here's what our investigation revealed. We discovered several glaring inconsistencies suggesting that Michael Jackson and Lisa Marie Presley were never even at the home of this magistrate, Hugo Alvarez. But he'll tell you they were. The magistrate claims that on the morning of May 26, Jackson and Presley arrived at his home in the town of La Vega in the rented white van. Well, I have the papers here 
I have the proof here. I make the ceremony and I make in my house. After the wedding, the newlyweds supposedly returned in the van to Casa de Campo. According to this customs document obtained by a current affair, they then left the country by private jet at exactly 12.20 p.m. This high-ranking military official in charge of the airport remembers getting Jackson's autograph just moments before the plane took off. What time was this? It was about 12.30. Uh, but by our calculations, if they were really married at 10 a.m., they could not possibly have been on that plane at 12.20. Captain DeWint agrees. He supposedly got married in La Vega around 10 o'clock in the morning. Could he have made it from La Vega to here in two hours? Impossible. From here to go to Las Vegas, you take about four hours. He couldn't have flown either because Captain DeWint confirms that no planes flew between La Vega and La Romana that morning. A current affair also obtained the actual rental agreements on both vans. They revealed that neither had been driven more than 159 kilometers. The round trip drive to La Vega is almost three times that distance. So, if the superstar couple didn't go to La Vega to get married, where did the ceremony take place? We do have evidence that proves that Michael Jackson never came here to La Vega. You have the proof? What kind of proof do you have? So we laid out our proof, evidence that the ceremony took place right where Jackson and Presley were staying at Casa de Campo. Look closely at this wedding picture. Here's the couple and Magistrate Alvarez. Carefully study the room. It's identical to this room at Casa de Campo, from the window shutters to the table, from the dark molding to the ceramic vase. It's also over 200 kilometers outside the jurisdiction of Magistrate Alvarez. 200 kilometers away from where even he admits he can legally perform a marriage. We asked the magistrate to explain. We have information that uh, says Michael actually asked you to come to La Romana to perform the wedding ceremony. That's not true. I don't have a, I don't know you say in English, uh, jurisdiction. It's, it's only here in La Vega. Jurisdiction? Yeah. So you can only perform wedding ceremonies here? Only here in La Vega, in La Vega yes. We confronted the magistrate about the many discrepancies we found. The rental van agreement, the departure document, the hotel room. And that's when this man of the law began to really sweat. Would you perform a wedding ceremony outside of La Vega, outside of your jurisdiction? No, never. It's not possible. But doesn't law say that you have to perform wedding ceremonies within your jurisdiction? Yes. So that sounds like it's illegal. Not. It's difficult to say in English to me. Well, let me ask you. No, I don't want any more question. It's, I finished that. It's better for you and for me. We obviously rattled Alvarez because as we tried to leave, his heavyset associate locked the door and demanded our tape, which we refused to turn over. Then they unplugged the phones. After a lot of pushing and shoving and our threat to press charges, Alvarez finally agreed to unlock the door. But no amount of bullying could erase what we discovered, evidence that has embarrassed the magistrate and further complicated the life of this troubled superstar. and we then obtained a search warrant to photograph Jackson to corroborate what the child has said. This telling mark occurred when Michael Jackson actually lifted his penis as if in a, an aroused state. <laughs> when things get aroused, you see the other side and those are the descriptions that he gave. When photographing Jackson's genitalia, it did cooperate. In other words, the boy saw Jackson naked. go 
to their graves believing in his righteousness. Sure. And just like I'm sure, you know, I don't want to compare it to what, you know, I'm sure there are fans of R. Kelly who would say, oh, the, 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 the accusers are all lying. That kind of a thing. So, um, it's kind of the sick way that we Westerners embrace celebrity. I quit because I found out some truths. He did something far worse to young boys and molest them. Even darker than the chamber case. The little black book. Jackson. His name is Joe Anthony. He states, sometimes I would drive up to the to Rancho Cucamonga and pick up a little girl named Gail, who was 10 years old. I used to pick her up and drive her out to Michael's house in Encino. He also had a condo over in Westward, over on Wilshire. And I'd drop this kid off, and after the weekend was over, I'd pick her up and drive her home. Michael would call me in the car and he used to think it was the girl's mother, you know, because of his high voice. Hello, let me speak to Gail, I remember her saying to me. Hey, Michael told me to tell you to roll up the partition and hang up the phone. I'd hang up the phone and roll up the partition, and they'd talk on the phone for an hour. God only knows what they had to say to each other. And this comes from a book, not about Michael Jackson, but about 1980s rock group named Rad. Rather interesting. This comes from an article by a man by the name of James Hudnall. The article is called My Disturbing Experience with Michael Jackson. This particular encounter actually happened at a comic book store. Mr. Hudnall writes, Jackson reappeared and left the store. I went out there with Bill and he introduced me. Jordy had detached from Michael and went to the black SUV. I didn't shake hands with Jackson. I only got to change pleasantries, but I noticed something when I tried to look him in the eyes. He had this very evasive, almost crazed look, like someone who had just committed a crime and didn't want anyone to see him. It was weird. I've met a lot of famous celebs and have never seen them as anything other than people. People who work in the entertainment industry, which I was doing at the time myself. So I've been very laid back in these accounts. So I know it was nothing more, nothing that I did. I thought to myself, man, he is paranoid or what? Maybe he is on something. After he took off, I went back to the store to buy some comics. And I asked one of my friends what they were doing in the back room for so long. He said Michael and Jory were in the bathroom for half an hour. Yeah, I said, huh? He said that's not unusual for him. Now I don't know what they did in there, but it was a small one person bathroom. And he only can think of a couple of reasons two people go into a small bathroom together. One of the reasons might be to be helping each other change costumes. He wasn't wearing anything out of the ordinary. So that leaves the other two reasons. Since we can assume Geordie is potty trained at the age of 13, it would probably be either sex or drugs. 
when the story about the molestation broke a few months later that pretty much made up my mind to what reason it was and he was discussing Jordan Chan. During an interview between Brando and prosecutors during Jackson's 1993 investigation, the actor recalled a conversation he had with Jackson at his Neverland ranch. I had asked him if he was a virgin, and he just sort of laughed and giggled, Brando said, in the recorded interview, adding that Jackson was uncomfortable with the F word and was too embarrassed to speak openly about his sex life. Brando continued that he went on to grill Jackson about the allegations of child abuse against him. Afterwards, he said Jackson began to cry and admitted to hating his father. With this mode of behavior that's been going on, I think it's pretty reasonable to conclude that the, he may have had something to do with kids, Brando said. My impression was that he didn't want to answer because he was frightened. Jackson was one of the great dichotomies and, and illusionist. Even more than a singer, he created a, a character that wasn't even him anymore. He became something other. And he tried to manifest that in, in the way he would dress, in the way he would look, in the way he changed his entire uh, physicality to become something different. But more importantly, I always felt that his brain was being pulled in two different directions. One, being very influenced by young people or images or impressions or children and the fact that there was an evil side they truly a and I think he wore that mask very very well because he 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 fooled people by trying to be very childlike and that's why I put the flowers in there they kind of kitschy and like oh a man like this could never be like that when in fact Deep down inside, you strip off the clothes, he sees himself as a very aggressive human being, even though he comes off as this passive individual. And, and he was one big ball of uh, contradictions and confusion. So what you're saying is that you felt an obligation to these children who are spending all this time together. Now, why do you think more children ever come forward? I think that, well, first of all, I know for a fact that there are a lot of children that are a lot older now and they probably have girlfriends. They're afraid and embarrassed because they don't want anyone to know that that happened to them when they were so infatuated at a young age when we lived at home. My mother knew everything that was going on. I have to admit, when I lived at home, I was a bit innocent. But did your mother try to talk to Michael about it? Did she try to say, hey, listen, what you're doing is wrong or she just played into it? No, my mother, was, she's actually the one who showed me the checks that were written. So, and I didn't understand it. So he, so he would write checks to people, and you're saying he would pay them off, pay off the parents, and say, "Hey, look." To the, to the children's parents, they, they're always, they were never like kids over at, at abundance. They were always like one at a time or whatever. But why would a and parent? One would go, then another would come, and then all of a sudden, my mother would snoop in his room, and she'd say, "Come here, I gotta show you something." I go, "What, mother?" I said, "Don't go in his drawers. He's gonna think it's me. He's gonna be upset. That kind of thing." And she would show me these checks, and I go, "What? So what about?" So how, so how did she explain the checks? Look at the amount. And the, you know how much the amounts were for? What? How much? A million dollars. A million dollars? You're saying checks? A check million dollars. A million dollar checks plus Rolls Royces. Wow. Who's that? This what Jack. Hey, Jack, what's that beat? Because he's taking up another line. Jay, you have to hang up. Hey, hey, Jack. Jack. Hey, Jack, hang up. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jack. Jack trying to get in on the conversation. Yeah, I can't stand. Yes, because he knows these checks are written for a million dollars. A million dollars. Now, you know, let me get this straight. Why would your mother... I would say... But why would your mother show you the checks for the million dollars? I'm just curious. She would... 
outraged. Right. When she she went ballistic when she saw this. She says, I said, so what? That's somebody that he likes. He wrote a check for. She goes, look at it good. You know what this is? She goes, this is Jimmy's safe check. This is a little boy that comes over here that stays with him and stays in that room and he locks himself up in the room with him and he, st- and he sleeps in the same bed with him. I just sleeps in the same bed with him. And she goes, yes, what do you think they do up there, Latoya? Well, and she knows all this and she knows it's true and she gets that television and she lies. I'm not doing this for money, Larry. I'm sorry, how are you lying me? Right. Who are you supposed to have, Larry King? You're getting ready to talk to Larry King. You're getting ready to talk to Larry King, Latoya. Absolutely not. I am not. That's, that's really, it's true, I am not. Honestly, guys, well, I'm not. listen, Latoya, listen. What is it, Jackie? Could you imagine being a family and your and you eight-year-old kid comes home with a check and mommy look like... Nah, here's how it goes. The way I, it's given, I, think, I think it's given to the parents. It's not given to the kids. I think it's given to the parents. And you're not selling this is a payoff to keep them quiet after they, they start to blab. This is payment from before. It's almost no, like no, no, no. it's almost like while it's going on. Like your son's Thank my you. friend and yeah, I'm how like, got it. Yeah, okay. it would almost be like, hey, here's a million bucks. Come on, yeah. let me play with your kid. Be happy. Uh, well, Howard got it. It's apparently, I'm not saying it is, but apparently it was to buy their silence. Wow. For their children. So now, but why else would it be? No. But I'm not. I'm, I'm saying this because these kids, you know, they they're infatuated. He shows them the world, and he puts them on big planes and flies them around and and sends planes for them. And my point is, yes, that's all good and wonderful, and, and the parents and mothers are loving it. However, what happens later on in life? So you've been living too so old. And he throws. He tosses them to the side after 13 or whatever. And say you're too old for me. So you've been living another one. So you've been living with this secret for a long time, and it's been eaten away at you, right? And now that it's it's come up in the news, you've been waiting and waiting and waiting, finally you said, I can't take this anymore? Well, it's not that I knew for sure, because I had never seen him in the act, so right. I cannot say. And, and like I said, I don't want to be a silent collaborator. That's why I'm speaking out. Right. And I, But you know something is going on, but you don't know exactly what. Mm-hmm. Because it's too strange. I just have to get in. Uh, as an acting teacher, I've taught members of the Jackson family. A private lessons here, and a couple of them were in my classes in Santa Monica. And I have to say, I agree with them that um, Michael was innocent. That's my opinion, <laughs> as a I, layman here. I don't, I don't argue with people about that. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, this is going to be an issue that I'll be wrestling with for the rest of my life, because people confront me with those types of things. And there's pro the and cons, I assume. Well, I, I mean, I don't see it as pro and cons, mm-hmm. but certainly yeah. there are plenty of people who do, and I don't debate yeah. them about that subject. If they want to believe in Michael Jackson's innocence, they're certainly welcome to do so. And his wife, what, uh, what Lisa I, Marie, thought he was innocent, too. Well, his wife was never his wife. I mean, Lisa they Marie nev- they, nev- they never had a marital relationship. I mean, the staff at Neverland told us she never once shared his room. So that wasn't a marriage that was really a marriage, right. nor was the one with Debbie Rowe. That, 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 that was, uh, the, both of those were shams. But, but what, what I find intriguing, frankly, is today the child who was involved in the case that I prosecuted, never mind the other two, who, who, who received judgments in, in, in terms of uh, uh, money, a great deal of money from Michael Jackson mm-hmm. to end their involvement in the criminal prosecution. But the one that I was involved in, uh, involving a child has never taken a penny that child was 12 years old when he was molested. He was 13 years old when he disclosed. And to this day, we still hear the defense attorneys walking around talking about this you know, family of grifters and thieves and criminals. Um, he was 13 when he gave a disclosure that was very consistent with what the other two kids did. Today, he's 20 years old, almost 21. He's an honor student at a prominent university on the East Coast. He has a 3.6 grade point average. He's majoring in philosophy and history. He's very actively involved in his church. He doesn't drink. He doesn't use drugs. He's never taken a penny from anybody on any issue dealing with this case, although he has continuous offers for six figures, which would pay all of his college tuition, and he has never taken a penny. He's never given an interview. He's never talked about it. He's probably going to go on to graduate school. I'm in touch with him regularly. I speak with him on a regular basis. Very actively involved in his church. Rather conservative rather conservative, registered Republican, which may be the nature of the school that he goes to, which tends to be a fairly conservative private school. But he's doing remarkably well. And uh, I I think that somebody who had an opportunity to spend some time with him would probably reflect very differently on what had happened. You're welcome to your opinion.
I don't right, care so how what much you're money saying you to me is you investigated the case. You came out of it convinced the kid was telling the truth. I did. The thirteen yes, year old was yes, telling the truth. Yes. Then it went away because Michael Jackson wrote a big check. Right. And you don't like that very much. No, because uh, uh, justice walked and money talked. I mean, that's just exactly what happened. Do you think Jackson should have been prosecuted? Yes, he should have been prosecuted immediately. He should have been arrested immediately. But what I think happened, and this is my own opinion, I think the DA's office sat back and figured we're going to get information from the civil case, and then we'll go ahead and file our case. When they, they, when they made the settlement, they lost their victim. See, if they'd have busted him in the first place, they would have had the victim. I don't care what you settled in the in the civil case, you had a criminal case yeah, filed. Do you really believe that uh, Gil Garcetti and the people out there in L.A. really wanted to prosecute this case? Because it would have been a zoo and it would have been all kinds of... Uh, yeah, but, my God, look what happened, though. Look what happened. I mean, you know, uh, to me, that's... <laughs> I've done a lot of things in my life, but one thing I won't do, I will not work for a pedophile. That's where I draw the line. If somebody's been accused of it falsely, I'd work to my dying breath because it's the worst thing you can accuse somebody of. But not something like that. He should have done his job, plain and simple. So he should have prosecuted you. You damn right he should have. Um, so angry about this. You bet I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Worst thing you've ever seen? Uh, it, it runs pretty close. I mean, if you, it, you know, and it's in my book. I mean, you read my book, and, and it explains just exactly what that boy had to say. And, and anybody that wants to draw their conclusions from that. I mean, I got the smoking gun in there, too. I got to tell you, because there was a bodyguard that worked for him for years. And, and this guy is a very religious guy, and, and he's made a statement under oath that uh, he picked up the phone, and it was uh, Jackson's head of security, uh, Jackson was calling the head of security, and they were having a fight about something. He knew it was Michael Jackson. He handed him the phone, and this guy said, You know, Michael, I can't believe you. He said, um, I went to um, the grand jury, and I lied about you molesting these boys, and you won't let me fire this guy. I can't believe this. So, so is there any guilt about his decision and the family, do they feel any guilt about their decision back in 1993 that perhaps had they testified in a criminal investigation or trial then that this current case could have been avoided? Well, you know, the decision was not really his at the time because he was a child. It was a family's decision, a parent's decision. But actually, you know, that's one of the biggest myths that's stuck around for 12 years that, that they refused to testify to a criminal trial. Actually, they agreed to testify to a criminal trial. Uh, provided that be given witness protection, the, the death threats were so serious, uh, you know, animals with their heads cut off, left at the door, telephone threats coming in, people trying to get into the house, into the place of business, bomb threats. Uh, last year, a uh, spokesperson for the LADA's office uh, confirmed that, in fact, that request was made and was denied. Had it been uh, approved and they got protection, the criminal trial would have gone forward.
case. Okay, you're talking about the case of Gavin Orvizo. And the thing about that case, it came to me when I was in the behavioral analysis unit and the FBI got involved as assisting the local law enforcement in understanding the case, doing the investigation, putting together the prosecution and so forth. And so just to be clear, that's before the criminal trial. Yes. So you guys were involved early on in the underpinnings of that case. Yes. And not only was Gavin Arvizo involved in that case at that time and being interviewed by the FBI and local law enforcement, but so was Jordy Chandler. And Jordy Chandler is the boy whose father negotiated, I think, a $24 million settlement with Michael Jackson after Michael Jackson sexually victimized Jordy Chandler and got them to agree to settle a case and to not bring charges against Michael Jackson, which, again, Jordy was a child. His father made that determination. Um, so $24 million has bought, or, you know, is easy to buy silence with $24 million. Right. Exactly. So the fact is that Jordy was told his story to law enforcement and separately Gavin Arvizo told his story to law enforcement and meshed perfectly in terms of grooming and sexual activity and descriptions of Michael Jackson's erect penis and so forth. That's what we call corroboration. Yes, it is corroboration. And although Jordy at some point agreed to participate in that prosecution backed out of it because there were serious family issues and ramifications and he did not want to put his family through that. Although he did agree to, if the case was not successful in California, that he would actually pursue a federal prosecution against Michael Jackson because Michael Jackson traveled with him interstate and sexually victimized him in other states. Well, and those, and there's still, I just want to be, I want to make sure our audience understands. Those charges, that's what I prosecuted as a prosecutor at the U.S. Attorney's Office, carry tremendous penalties. Yes. So he, Michael Jackson could have faced federal prosecution for crossing state lines with intent to engage in sexual activity with a child, which also called illegal criminal sexual activity. And those carry anywhere from a 10-year mandatory minimum to a 30-year to life. So they're very serious charges that could have been brought. I have no doubt in my mind that if Jordy Chandler were able to testify in that case, and if Wade Robson and James Safechuck had been able to come forward and testify at that time, and I'm not blaming them for not doing it, I'm just telling you if that happened, that Michael Jackson would be alive today and in prison. The situation was that Jordy Chandler had agreed to go forward with a federal prosecution if the case in Santa Clarita was not successful in convicting Michael Jackson. However, that case was dragged out and delayed over and over again until the point where Jordy Chandler's statute of limitations had expired. He could no longer bring a federal case. And because of how the case basically disintegrated with respect to Gavin Arvizo, that case wasn't brought for him either. So, Michael Jackson did not get prosecuted federally. Would he have been convicted federally? I don't know, because it's very difficult to convict a celebrity in the first place, and an iconic celebrity, it's much more difficult to convict. However, I did believe Jordy Chandler. I did believe Gavin Arvizo. I did believe Star Arvizo, who was a witness in Gavin's case. I do believe... Wade Robson, I do believe James Safechuck, and I do believe there are multiple other boys that were victimized by Michael Jackson and groomed by Michael Jackson, and they have not felt safe to come forward because they believe that they will be attacked. Well, and they will be attacked because Jimmy and Wade have been attacked. But what I want to ask you, Jim, this is such an important question to me. Why do you believe them? I know... It's more than just that they corroborate each other. I know it's more than that. So what else is there that you know about this case or that you know about Michael Jackson generally? What other evidence was there out there that tells you that he was sexually attracted and sexually interested in children besides just the testimony of multiple children, which should be and is legally enough? But it's not just 
the testimony of them, but internally their testimony is reliable in that it all makes sense in terms of the behavior of somebody who's sexually attracted to children. It's not just somebody saying, oh, I want to get money, so I'm going to say this. Well, you don't know as a child, and you're being interviewed as a child in some cases or as an adult later, but you don't know how the behavior actually stacks up to somebody like me who's an expert in this field. And when you tell me how the, the, the sequence of events from day one to the day we're sitting there talking to each other, everything that was done, the way you tell me it and how the pieces fit together internally in your story and then how they corroborate the other victims and their stories when we know what was actually put out in the public was just you know scratching of the surface now with leaving neverland we have a very detailed account that's the kind of account i had in the arviso case and in the jordy chandler case and in cases of other people who i know their story but they did not want to testify and i'm not going i can't in good conscience out them i can't say well this person doesn't want to tell you but this person actually came forward told his story but did not want to testify incident on the train this comes from an FBI report from the time. Another haunting tip from 1993 summarizes a telephone conversation with a woman from Toronto, Canada, who said that both she and her husband worked in child services. According to handwritten notes, the couple claimed to have taken a train from Chicago to the Grand Canyon in 1992. Michael Jackson allegedly had four compartments on the train which would continue on to California. Jackson was allegedly traveling with a 12 to 13 year old boy who was ID'd as Michael's cousin. The document continues. Jackson was very possessive of the boy at night. The caller heard questionable noises through the wall. She was so concerned that she notified the conductor of her suspicions. Mr. Jackson, in the latter portion of 1993, there were some allegations leveled at you concerning improper conduct with some young boys. Uh, I assume you're familiar with the fact that those allegations were raised, is that right? Yes. In fact, there was ultimately uh, at least two uh, grand jury inquiries into that that I am currently aware of, although counsel tells me there may have been a third. Uh, were you aware that a grand jury investigations were conducted into those allegations? Yes. When, strike that, did you know at the time that the grand jury was investigating these matters uh, that they were in fact investigating, in other words, you didn't find out after it had completed, you knew in advance that people were being subpoenaed to testify. In advance? Yeah, poorly phrased. Let me rephrase it. <clears throat> it is my understanding that some of Neverland Valley Ranch employees were subpoenaed to testify before the grand jury. Do you know that to be the case as well? Yes. Are you familiar with a person named Jordy Chandler? We're not going there. Uh, don't answer. Um, we're not going to get into who he knows and doesn't know. 
If you want to ask a question, go ahead and ask it. But I believe it's beyond the scope of discoverable matters in the case. Whether he knows of Jordy Chandler? Right. You're not going to allow me to ask him any questions about Jordan Chandler in any fashion? Well, we'll take them one by one, but... Well, I can't ask him whether he knows him. I suppose that would sort of preclude other ones, don't you think? Yeah, probably would. And may I ask, for the record, what the basis upon which you are going to refuse to allow this witness to disclose whether he knows Mr. Jordan Chandler? As you know, counsel, during the course of discovery in this case, you have already gone into, and I think Mr. Sanger has already gone into, at some depth, a deposition that was taken in the case of Jordy Chandler versus Michael Jackson, given by Adrian McManus. There are issues that are certainly relevant to my interest as to why you inquired as to those depositions that Adrian gave, and you're now telling me I can't even ask whether he knows the man or go into any such areas? Yeah, let me let me Isn't there a quote that. that comes to mind of what's good for the goose is good for the gander? Oh, come on, Karen. <laughs> what? Uh, <In> South Spain. <laughs> in my, let me just make sure my understanding is clear. Is it your position that you will instruct Mr. Jackson not to answer any questions that pertain to the issue of Jordy Chandler in any way, whether it be claims leveled by Jordy Chandler, if any, uh, or discovery in the Jordy Chandler case vis-a-vis -vis Adrian McManus's deposition and allegations that she uh, testified falsely. Any of that you're not going to let him go into? Uh, I don't, that's right. I, think, I believe that's correct. Um, with respect to the motivations that are, in your view, germane to the allegations made in the complaint, my client has testified that he knows nothing about those matters that you want to explore his motivations on. So therefore, there's a lack of foundation. But let's just go do what you want to do. You've raised something that sort of catches me by surprise. You say your client has testified that he knows nothing about these matters. Uh, is this at today's deposition you're referring to or some other deposition that I was not present at? Today. That is strange since I have not, I have not asked about that issue until just now. I have not asked about the allegations specifically. I have asked about investigation. Were you aware that Jordan Chandler or his family on his behalf filed a litigation, a lawsuit against you? Yes. Okay. Were you aware at, that at some point in time in that lawsuit, Adrian McManus gave her deposition? I'm not positive. Your answer confuses me. Uh, how do you mean you're not positive? You don't know whether she gave her deposition or not? Exactly. So then, if I understand it correctly, you are not going to allow me to go into any areas in connection with Brett Barnes. Is that right? Well, you can ask. I, there's nothing I can think of, but if you... I'm not going to categorically say you can't ask anything about him, but I don't think there's anything relevant. So irrelevant that I'm not inclined to let you get into it unless there's an area that you believe is directly tied to the case. Well, I believe it, but I have a feeling that my believing it's not going to convince you of much. To your knowledge, Mr. Jackson, um, were you ever accused of having sexually molested Brett Barnes? Who won't answer that. Do you know a person by the name of Macaulay Culkin? Yeah. Get your answer. So you're going to let him answer questions about Macaulay Culkin? Let him answer that one. To your knowledge, were you ever accused of having sexually molested Macaulay? That's an instruction not to answer on that one.
is as good a copy of the document as I have available mm -hmm. to me at this time. Let me ask you this. Do you recognize the uh, handwriting on these two sheets? Yes. Do you know whose handwriting it is? It's mine. Do you know what these documents are? Yeah. What is this? Um, crazy stories that people have uh, created. Things I wanted to set straight in an interview. Do you know with whom this interview was? The next, I think it could have been Diane Sawyer, whatever the interview was that I wanted to do. I wanted to set the record straight, that if people hear a lie long enough, people believe it, that people have lied on me. I'm a black American and I'm proud of it, and I'm honored of it. The bleach skin rumor, which is a rumor, I don't bleach my skin. They, they once said I wanted a white kid to play me as a child, which was a rumor. <laughs> Uh, inauguration rumor saying I didn't want to do President Clinton's inauguration. I'm not gay. Uh, this says, don't judge a person unless you have sp spoken to them one on one, which which is true. Because uh, what you hear is a lie, uh, untrue. I can't make out this part there. It is illegible in portions. That's true. And Jesus said to love the children and be like children. Be no. youthful and be innocent and be pure and honorable. He was talking to his apostles and they were fighting over who's the greatest among themselves. And he said, whoever humbled yourself like this child is the greatest among me. And he always surrounded himself like with children. And that's how I was raised to believe and to be like that and to imitate that. So I don't know what you're trying to make out of it. I made a list of things. I, when I get angry enough, I write down what I want to say and what I want to talk about to set the record straight. You should get to a point where you get tired of people lying. I get tired of situations like this, where people completely lie on me, and I'm sick of it. The video uh, operator, we're off the record. I have the conclusion, 411. Jeans. I would be. I, I would remember that to this day. You remember. 
remember, would you be I'm, so, uh, would that have, have caused you to have to go into therapy for 10 years? I think I've been to therapy for less than that. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I cannot, I can't condone that, okay, whatsoever. The whole 93 scandal broke in the middle of the tour. Yep. Uh, so you have been a, a percipient witness to the whole thing. So, I mean, what was, what was going I on was there? In, I was in Neverland shooting something. And Jordan Chandler was there. And I have a picture somewhere of Michael patting Jordan's head. Jordan's wearing a baseball cap in this picture. You know, and the scandal breaks three weeks later. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, what a horrible situation, you know. Just thinking about when the news broke around those allegations um, with Jordan Chandler, a, a, a much lesser man would have would have sold that image of Michael patting Jordan Chandler on the head. Imagine how much that would have been worth at that moment. That image, by the way, is kept under lock and key so that in case anything happens to me, it doesn't fall into the wrong hands, even today. And I mean that sincerely. There are people who have seen it. I had conversations at the time with uh, some of Michael's people about what we want to do to kill and suppress those images. We did. We suppressed all sorts of, you know, there was a photo shoot that I did of Jordan that Michael paid for. We killed it. It's gone. Doesn't exist. Craig, I'm just trying to see if this thing works. One, two. I'm not a narcissist. Just trying this mirror effect, testing the camera, seeing how well it works. Do. Oh yeah. What? Things blinking. Something's weird about this. Something's weird here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seven, eight, nine. There had been an occasion when Michael Jackson was examined and his genitalia was recorded, which was part of an investigation. And that was the 300 pound gorilla in the mediation room. We wanted to do all that we could to avoid the possibility that there would be a criminal invest, uh, a, a criminal filing against Michael Jackson. And the reality was we were hopeful that if we were able to quote unquote silence the accuser that would obviate the need for any concern about the criminal side so from our perspective there was a great deal of trust not only with johnny and larry because they had a 20-year prior friendship there was tremendous trust with johnny and the three judges being recommended and we were facing the purple gorilla in the room of if we don't get this case settled before March, there is a criminal investigation looming, and no one wanted to consider the implications of that as it affected Michael Jackson, the king of pop.
This is a story from Sean Lennon's childhood friend, Mark Ronson. He writes, it's a weird story, but I didn't touch him. We, meaning Lennon and Ronson, used to watch the porn channel because we were like 10 and oh my God breasts. So Michael was in bed and Sean said, Michael, do you want to see something cool? We turned the dial to the porn channel and there were strippers shaking their breasts. We were like, Michael, Michael, how cool is this? We turned around and he was crying, say, oh, saying, oh, stop it, stop it, it's silly. We were like, Michael, you have to look. Maybe you're not seeing it right. It's naked girls. He was not down with the program whatsoever. I think he had really strong views on porn. And that's from Mark Ronson. Sean Lennon's childhood friend. This is some commentary from Sean Lennon regarding a song he wrote called Bubbles Burst and a video he did for it as well. He writes, I was telling Les about it and we were talking about song topics and it just seemed like it fit with the theme of trippy narratives that our record had and I thought it'd be interesting to write about something that actually happened. It just felt right. I mean, I resisted much of my life talking about those kinds of stories because they just seemed so hard to figure out how to translate them or even relate them. And I just thought it was an interesting metaphor for what happened to a lot of Michael Jackson's friends who were my age. It felt like there was something odd going on and I still don't know what it was. Nothing ever happened with me in an illegal way, but the whole place just felt like I was in some sort of Peter Pan fantasy island. And there was a sense that were, when Bubbles got too old, he'd have to be gotten rid of because chimpanzees turned to angry adults or dang dangerous adults. And it just felt like that it was something I could relate to in terms of the whole situation out there because there was something Michael liked about hanging out with kids because they're so innocent and fun. Then when you become an adult, it felt like you were a chimpanzee, too old to play with anymore. Michael Jackson fans are still reeling from child sex abuse allegations detailed in the documentary Leaving Neverland. Just at the weekend, no less than Barbara Streisand and Diana Ross weighed into the debate. There is no middle ground, it seems. Either you think he was guilty or you angrily reject that. US rabbi Shmuley Botaic was once a very close friend and advisor to Jackson and always believed in his innocence until now. The, the documentary is devastating. Every night that I was with him, there was abuse. It's hard to go back to that moment. It's uh, painful, it's traumatizing. Hello, Wade. Congratulations, little one. Today is your birthday. Michael Jackson was a uniquely American tragedy. I love you. The allegation claimed that entertainer Michael Jackson... Explosive HBO documentary Leaving Neverland has generated debate around the world. The king of pop's legacy under massive scrutiny. Claims of child molestation have always swirled around the megastar. And now, for the first time, we hear detailed accusations of sexual abuse from the victims. I want to be able to speak the truth as loud as I had to speak the lie for so long. Australian choreographer Wade Robson the wedding. and James Safechuck. He would reward me with jewelry for doing sexual acts. Oh. Former close friend of Michael Jackson, Rabbi Shmuley Botek, is one of many left traumatized by the revelations of Neverland. And there's a very big difference to the past. The difference, of course, is that first and foremost, you see uh, two boys who are now men who are speaking with deep pain. I think the abuse symptoms intensify when you have kids. And then you see how like innocent kids are 
I'd like to talk about how you met him and how you became friends in the first place. Can you background us? A mutual friend introduced me to Michael, and given that I'm a rabbi and he's not Jewish, uh, I didn't know if there would be a deep spiritual connection between us. Michael was a Jehovah's Witness, but I was amazed at how deep that spiritual bond was. I think people forget that Michael was once a missionary. He used to go on Sundays and knock on people's doors. You can imagine that someone of that celebrity and fame knocks on your door and he's giving out the Watchtower magazine, what the reaction might be. When was that? When did he do that? Um, when he, even after Thriller, he continued. He was raised a very devout Jehovah's Witness. And there were other things that connected us. Michael was a very devoted father. I, I, I saw in him uh, a gentility and a softness that uh, could be a little bit rare among uh, celebrities and big celebrities. But he was extremely reclusive. Maybe the absence of inspiration was due to feeling uh, hated, loathed, judged by a lot of the world. What year was it? 99 to 2001. That's when you were friends, two years yes. from 99 to 2001. Correct. Michael Jackson, sadly, before we even look at these allegations and leaving Neverland, you have to understand that Michael was a tragic figure before that, not to this degree. I'm not talking about criminality. He was a tragic figure because of the tragedy of superstardom. Superstardom is a uniquely American creation, and, and Michael Jackson was a uniquely American tragedy. We are the ones who gave the world Elvis, and, and, and Marilyn Monroe, and, and Michael Jackson. And, the, and none of them had a, 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 a positive uh, demise. I don't believe that you, human beings are designed to live as gods. The moment I began to feel like my advice could not be heeded, because I wasn't a fan, I was a friend. I wasn't a hanger-on, I was a rabbi, and I felt that I had, I had to leave, and that's when I severed our relationship. Jordy was the new kid, the new boy. You know, I used to be the boy who was in there with Michael. When they were disappearing, they were doing all that same sexual stuff. In 1999, when you met him, the allegations uh, made against him by Jordan Chandler's family had been around for a few years by then. They had been dealt with, he'd, he'd paid that family off. Had you believed those allegations? Michael Jackson is at the center of a criminal investigation. There was much speculation. I didn't know if to believe it or not. We didn't know. What I did know was that regardless of whether it was true or not, Michael could never again really be around children. Michael said he wanted to leverage his celebrity to help him with his children. So what I said to him is, you were never meant to be the child's messiah. Stop thinking that you're the one who's supposed to give all the world's neglected children attention. Because I know you, and I know you're a moral man, and uh, I'm thinking that you would have not forged a close relationship with Michael Jackson if you had believed that he could have been guilty of molesting Jordan Chandler. In 1993, for whatever reason, um, I can't comment as to why a family would have chosen to settle as opposed to take it to the next level legally? The answer is that I, I didn't know. The answer is that we had to presume that hopefully it was not the case, and we had to have our eyes open to see if anything would raise alarm bells. Jackson's people claim the charges are part of an extortion plot. A $23 million payout to the Chandler family to keep quiet didn't stop those alarm bells ringing, and more victims came forward. Did you meet Gavin Arviso at Neverland? Gavin's family uh, arrived um, one day, and I was actually kind of convinced that Michael had brought them almost to impress me, uh, to show me his good works, because Gavin was a child who was suffering from cancer. Good day, everyone. Pop star Michael Jackson is now under arrest. In and so South. later, when the allegations about Gavin Arviso surfaced, and Michael did face a trial for that, how did you process those allegations, given what you knew? Really, again, very reclusive, very secluded. And so it was hard for me to believe that anything had happened because Gavin was also there with his family. By the time I met Michael, he wasn't really around children at all. He wasn't around anyone, to be perfectly honest. Okay. You were giving in the presumption of innocence with Gavin Arviso, and ultimately he was acquitted. Um, you gave him the presumption of innocence with Jordan Chandler. You've now seen this documentary, Leaving Neverland. How do you feel about his innocence now? There will have to now be a fundamental reassessment of the legacy of Michael Jackson in light of this documentary. Because we've never heard allegations that were this 
explicit. We've never really seen the, the faces of the accusers as they make these allegations. And we've never really heard the family members who had to shoulder that, that pain. I didn't protect my son. That will always, always haunt me. To see the guilt that the parents are feeling touched me very deeply. Maybe I can forgive him at some point if I try to understand that he was sick. But forgiving myself is another thing. I don't know if I will ever do that. He destroyed these people. When you marry someone who has experienced deep trauma and how you have to help carry that burden. Now I'm hearing stories about what was done to his young body. Why can't you share your bed? That the, the most loving thing to do is to share your bed with someone. You cannot share a bed with someone else's child. That is immoral, it is unacceptable, it's deplorable. I remember watching it and feeling that I had been kicked in the stomach. I could not believe that he had done that and that he had said it and that he didn't understand that there was something wrong. If Cardinal Pell was a uniquely Australian tragedy of a country traumatized by its more senior religious prelate accused of these monstrous crimes, Michael was almost a high priest of superstardom. And you can also then do things for which you're not called out on. This is a profound morality tale for all of us. I mean, there are similarities between those two cases and there are clearly differences. Michael Jackson was never convicted. George Pell has been convicted. Um, you are having to completely recalibrate your opinion of a man you once liked. I don't believe these men are lying. And then I would go home and be a wreck. And I don't believe that the shame and guilt being experienced by their parents in general, maybe their mothers in particular, so. is feigned. And Australians, but devout Catholics, are having to either completely recalibrate their opinion of the Cardinal George Pell, or they're, or they're saying that his, his victim is lying. And that's, you know, there's a division in our society right now. He continues to declare his innocence. Two former and prime ministers. It is going on appeal. Came out and gave character evidence, if you like, on behalf of Cardinal George Pell and said that his conviction didn't change their opinion of him. I think the cognitive dissonance kicks in with all of us. It kicks in with religious figures, it kicks in with politicians. Cognitive dissonance is our inability to kind of confront the most painful truths the most painful truths. And I can understand that when you have someone who is the head of an entire church for an entire country, they still revere and respect religious figures. But, but that trauma doesn't excuse our need, our responsibility to speak out and to accept that there's right and wrong in this world. So were John Howard and Tony Abbott wrong to defend George Pell? We can't ignore the evidence either, and we can't ignore the testimony, and we can't, because as I said, we're not on mission, we're not God. To be fair to Michael, he was exonerated by a jury in the same way that Cardinal Pell was convicted by a jury. The difference now is that you have very compelling, a very compelling narrative. When everyone says, Michael was so famous, that's why all of this happened, that people allowed it. Why did we allow anyone to reach a level of superstardom where their actions are not questioned. All we have, Tracy, in this world that we inhabit is our moral compass. And the moment our moral compass no longer works properly or efficiently, that's when humanity makes terrible, terrible mistakes. Wade Robson and James Safechuck's lawsuits against Michael Jackson's estate are currently on appeal. The Jackson family has denied all the allegations in the documentary. After Jackson's death, Rabbi Shmuley released a book called The Michael Jackson Tapes, based on hours of conversations with the superstar.